there, and welcome to another midweek guest episode of Oof! Right in the Childhood. Today, I'm joined by Rob Kaiju of Kaiju FM. Rob, thanks so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. Why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, as I'm sure you can tell, I am a Brit. I am a podcaster. I run the Kaiju FM network. Um, we are a collection of shows that are interested in the niche and the weird and unusual. So we have a show that is watching all of Looney Tunes and trying to build a cohesive universe of it all. We have a homebrewing show. We have a couple of D&D shows. And my show, the sort of the first show on the network, is called The Prestige, which is a movie review and discussion show. Um, I used to work in the film industry, and my co-host is an English lecturer. So he has theory information, and I have practical information, and we bring those two things together to talk about movies and we're currently doing a mini season looking at the history of the heist movie wow so you not only do movie reviews but you focus on the weird and unusual which um really is the wheelhouse for the three caballeros yes i haven't yet managed to convince my co-host to do a disney season because he (laughs) just doesn't isn't a fan um so when uh the chance came up to talk about uh disney and particularly early Disney and the Three Carreros, I thought, now's my chance. I can I can spread my wings here and get it off my chest. Well, that's that's so fantastic. And I'm absolutely thrilled to have you on the uh, the show today. Um, so um, why don't we just jump in? And uh, how about you tell me a little bit about like why you were so excited about the Three Caballeros in specific? Because I know you were you were like, oh, I want to talk about Saludos Amigos or the Three Caballeros. And the Three Caballeros fell into the podcast. So um, anything specifically about this movie that you remembered be- before you watched it again? Yeah, well, given the the show, if we've been talking about this, I saw this in my childhood, um, which as a white kid from middle England was quite rare because obviously it is not a international picture in the way that other Disney films were. I do not know how it ended up in our possession. My uncle had it recorded off TV, I think, or recorded off somewhere. It was like a home bootleg version of the movie um and he gave it to us i must have been i don't know eight or nine if that so you know looking at 30 years ago now and i just remember as a kid being like entranced by how weird this was we'd watched fantasia so that was kind of we'd always experienced a bit of the weirdness from that but just the three characters was this weird fever dream of a movie from my childhood um, and I grew up before streaming or all DVDs. It was like this just thing that I remembered watching this really weird, incredibly weird Donald Duck cartoon from my, from my childhood. And it wasn't until I got older um, and the internet came about and I got to sort of find it. I found it again. And I remember, must have been, I don't know, five years ago, five, six years ago. Um, I will confess I found a copy on the, online and watched it and thought, oh, this is, this is as, as weird, if not weirder than I remember it being. And I just think it's so unusual in disney canon now we've got disney plus uh, i have a daughter and i've tried to make her watch it she is not keen yet um but she is a, she is only <laughs> four so give her some time um but so far she isn't overly interested in this movie but yeah it was just one for my childhood and it is the one of those movies that not a lot of people have seen no I, I, absolutely when i when i told my husband i was like so the thing that comes after Bambi is called the Three Caballeros, and he was like the Three What? And I was like, "Yep, that's uh, that's how I reacted. I've never heard of this movie." Um, and so, uh, me trying to explain to him what this movie was afterward, he was like, "Well, that that's weird." Mm. And it, it's, I mean, it's a weird movie because it isn't really a theatrical movie in the way that other Disney ones were. It's a government propaganda piece tr- trying to encourage Latin America to support America and be friends with America during the war. That's what the, the purpose of the movie was. So oh, absolutely, it yeah. doesn't have that same kind of need of being like a theatrical movie that other ones have. And because it isn't as well known to about, I just thought it was a great time to talk about it, basically. And it's interesting. I think, you know, it is one that my experience of it as a child is different to my experience of it as an adult because I was a child and I didn't get some of the jokes and certainly some of the um horn dugness of Donald Duck, shall we say? <laughs> went over me as a kid. Um but yeah, I, I just I think this film is it's one of those ones that I really triumph and tramp champion. Because you do see if you go to Disneyland, you do see um the Caballeros there. They are there. 
especially in Epcot, they have them in the uh, in the Mexico Pavilion, I believe. So they are part of the current mythology, but the movie is mostly forgotten. Um, so yeah, that's that's why I want to talk about it. Well, that, it's so fun, and uh, you know, I would I I kind of had the same reactions of the Donald Duck corn dogness. I was like, oh yes, this is they're they're bringing war upon a beach for girls having swimsuits. Yeah. Um, yay! <laughs> It's very, it's very, I mean, I think we've talked about it a lot, but it, it is an incredibly weird film. Absolutely. I I, I want to know the acid that they got to drop for that movie. It was just so much whatever. Yeah, <laughs> but I do like the fact that it gets weirder. Like it starts off quite normal. The first, it's like this busy, so there's like five or six little scenes that build up the movie. And the first one is just a penguin. It's a traditional sort of Disney short. A penguin lives in, in, lives in Antarctica, wants to be warmer, and goes on this sort of voyage up through South America. And it goes from there to the last section is, is quite literally called Donald's Surreal Reverie. And it is just mm. so weird and bizarre. And it's just like, I look back now, I think of me as a child watching this. And I'm like, this must have warped me in such weird ways my parents just left me to it go watch that and i thought this is just so strange because it's unlike any other kind of disney theatrical piece beyond possibly fantasia which has some certainly some more um i don't know allegorical and surreal elements to it um but you, but you were talking on your maybe your last episode about the uh pink elephant sequence in dumbo um mm -hmm. and that's that same kind of thing where disney leaves reality behind and goes off on these surreal as you say acid fueled visual trips um and i just think it's this film really highlights that skill of theirs and it's good fun i mean the music's amazing it's such a colorful and beautiful movie oh it is and I, I i do talk about in my in my synopsis of this about how beautiful some of the art is mm. uh because we get to see styles of art in this film that we never saw before and we never saw again. Mm -hmm. uh, we get the traditional Mexican looks and and some of that kind of stuff. And uh, the fact that they sent a whole passel of different artists down to South America to learn to draw like the Latinx countries did and learn the music of the Latinx countries, I, I think that really, really shows through in this. Yeah, I mean, the, the sequence, I think about halfway through, the uh, Las Posadas, I think it's called, uh, which is the um, sort of nativity story. It's this really mm -hmm. like beautifully hand drawn, and of it's all hand drawn, but this looks like hand hewn kind of uh, animation, and it really sort of contrasts so wildly with the other uh, with the other bits of animation. It's just it's really nice, and you get the feeling that this sort of government commission to build these bonds with America gave the Disney team a chance to really stretch and really push the boundaries and bring in these otherwise non-North American styles of animation. Yeah, I, I really like that Los Posados uh, piece too. And um, one of the things I kept wondering was, is this the first time that white Americans in the 1940s had ever heard of a pinata? Mm -hmm. You know, that cause like, because now pinatas are everywhere, but I, I don't have the ability to go back in time and say, did you, did y'all know about this before this happened? before this happened. Um, and, and um, I also talk about um, the section in uh, Brazil with the Kindim's about, this is a very specific Brazilian dessert, mm. the Kindim. And it was like, there wasn't a way to research this. You just kind of like dumped a whole bunch of information on all these white folks. And it was like, good luck with that. I mean, that, that's the thing that I really amazes me because I saw it say in the early nineties. Um, and like, I had no, I had encyclopedias was probably the limit of my ability to look these things up. Um, and I was like, these days to say senior piñata, seeing sombrero and seeing all this stuff, it's just like, well, that's, that's Mexican culture, you know, and like through travel shows, cookery shows, and over here, I mean, over in America, you've got much more of a Mexican influence on your general culture. Like these things have become part of culture, but back then this must have been like a view on another world. This podcast is sponsored by my patrons on Patreon. I love creating content for you, and becoming a patron on my Patreon helps me cover hosting fees and upgrade the equipment I use while allowing me to minimize ad time. 
At the $5 level, you not only get an ad-free version of each episode a day earlier than it's released, but starting next month, you get a special bonus episode on the first of each month with content available exclusively on Patreon. In October, I investigate the role of Walt Disney Productions during World War II, from the occupation of the studio by the U.S. military to the hundreds of hours of training and propaganda that the studio released. I also provide synopses and commentary for the cartoon portions of eight of the propaganda pieces they released during the war. Information for my Patreon can be found on my website at oofmychildhood.com. And I, I mean, mm-hmm. I can't, I, I honestly can't hand and heart and say how well it does it. Um, Cause I don't know too much about sort of the, uh, not the racism, but sort of the uh, presumptions that the show, that the film makes about um, South American culture, but it seems pretty on the nose. And obviously given it's trying to sell to Latin America, you think they're to get it right, but it just feels so authentic and weird as like a, as I say, as a white Brit who had no link, and Mexican food is not a thing that existed back then. I didn't eat Mexican food until mm-hmm. I was probably in my late twenties because it just isn't over here. Right, and and so the first time when I started doing the the history of this, I, I actually found several blogs of of Latinx people discussing how important uh, the Three Caballeros mm. was in their household and how they grew up with this movie, and you know. I'm not going to say that it's a great representation of Latinx culture, but I will say that it's probably the best representation of culture up until that point Mm -hmm. in Disney. And actually for many years later, um, you know, they, they at least gave it a try. Uh, (laughs) You know, they, they portrayed them in a positive way and, and they did their best. They had actual uh, Brazilian people dancing and singing in the Brazilian scene. They had actual Mexican people dancing in the Mexican scenes. Um, they, they they tried at least. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm going to give them a thumbs up for giving it a whirl. Yeah, I mean, I think, that, you know, I, at a certain point, there's the element of being seen, which, as I say, it's not a thing that I've ever had to contend with. And I've got the privilege of that in my life that it's not a thing I've had to battle with. But I can imagine that Disney, who are now the biggest media conglomerate in the world but even back then they were still the biggest name in the game of this kind of stuff to have them make a movie about your culture and not do a terrible job of it is got to have been some sort of thing for them they got to have meant something yeah i, I hope so and it, it does seem like um it was such a big deal for mm. Uh, for the the Latinx people, um, at least from what I what I can see online, I'm not going to say that I know everything about no. it because I mean I'm white too. But uh, <laughs> I I kind of talk about in the um, that section with the flying donkey. I was like, hey, they actually talked about yerba mate and bocce ball, mm. and and they gave us all these Spanish words for for all these pieces of clothing, and it's like they they actually tried. Yeah, and that's the weird thing is it's something that we talk about on my other show quite a lot is the idea that not every movie is for everybody that I like as, as a straight white male, a lot of culture is to serve me and I shouldn't extend that to every bit of media. You know what I'm saying? And this movie is one of those, like, it's a weird, that's why I like it. Cause it's a Disney who are the most white of white bread, you know, media conglomerates produce this. And it's, it's just not for me Like in the terms of like, as an audience, like I love it. I think it's brilliant but I was not the audience for it. And so I've got to come at this movie with an element as an adult, which I didn't have as a kid, of thinking that I'm not going to get all these references because it's not made for me. It's not a movie that is thinks about me as its audience, which I think, especially for Disney at this time, because I think as you, as you, as you move forward your show, you'll come across, I mean, I'm sure you'll come across some terrible um, depictions. Oh God! Um, I don't know if you're going to do Song of the South, but that's a horrible film. I will I, not. I, <laughs> I actually speak to that, and I I say I refuse to do Song of the South because I feel like my entire synopsis would be like, well, that was racist, <sighs> and that was also racist, and hey, more racism, yeah. and that just doesn't sound like fun for anyone. I have seen the Song mm-hmm. of the South. It was played on Disney Channel when I was a kid, um, and I remember like even at eight or nine years old going 
uh, this doesn't feel good. No. Um, and so like, I just, I'm just not going to touch it with the 10 foot pole. And besides I'm kind of focusing on the ones that are available through Disney plus and it's not so For the best. good enough. I will say this. I, I am a VHS collector. So I, I collect VHS and one of my collections is that is Disney. I have almost all the Disney films released on VHS, like literally within reach of where I'm sitting right now. Um, and I did own Song of the South. I did own a VHS Song of the South. Um, but about know, five, six years ago, I was having a clear out. I just looked at it and thought, I don't want to own this. I'm never going to watch it. I'm never going to want my child to watch it. I'm never going to want anyone to watch this. And so I got rid of it. And I keep the rest of the collection. I've got the rest of the Disney films. Um, but I just thought, I'd, I'm just going to get rid of that. And I haven't regretted it for a moment. Well, good for you. That's that's good to hear. And, you know, I I, I thought, well, there's going to be someone who's upset that I'm not going to do Southern in the South, but my show's not for them. So Especially. they can move along. Totally. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, all of that aside, I, I do think Cabrera's is, it's worth seeing. Um, if you have an interest in Disney or you have an interest in Latin America, or even you just want to watch, because it is a good movie. It is, it is surreal and weird for Disney, but it is a good film. Well, yeah, and it gave us a lot of things that they got to use later. Mm. Like, uh, this was their first truly, like, experimental film, if you're going to get away from the fact that Snow White was an experiment in and of itself mm. that no one knew how to, you know, use. Uh, but, like, th they did live action with animation for the first time. Um, and, and, like, built that gave us some stuff that gets to build on as we move forward with Disney. And uh, And, yeah, I think it... All in all, it was a great movie to watch, even though I kind of went, uh, <laughs> about half the time of it. Like, yeah. you know, And then also, hey, please, could we not shoot the ladies for, <laughs> it is, for saying no? Yeah, it, like, it, 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 that was the one thing that really struck me, watching it now. That I'm, I've seen it in adulthood before, um, but I've never really approached it with a bit more of an analytical eye before this rewatch yesterday. But I really, like, it really felt quite... I wouldn't say sexist because it isn't sexist, but I would say just like incredibly male gaze in the way it approached a lot of the women in it, um, especially from, so say duck gaze, I suppose then. Like it's, it is very, <laughs> I, I, for want of a better word, horny. It is just so, everything is about these three birds looking at women, seeing women, appreciating those women, and as you say, dive bombing them on the beach because they're in bikinis. And these are, these are live action women. It isn't like, I mean, there is some animated women in sort of silhouettes and that kind of thing, but these are live action women with whom these birds become obsessed. And it, it is, for a Disney film, which is essentially a kid's company, it's very, I don't know what, it's just strange, I suppose. I call it creepy. Yeah. I, I refer to it as creepy. <laughs> Y'all are creepy. It, it, was, it was just, it moved very quickly from beyond being appreciative just being a bit leery well i i really appreciate you coming and talking to us today i mean like absolutely i think everyone should should take the time and and watch this and see uh what uniqueness uh was born from world war ii yeah. trying to you know please don't put bombs near <laughs> near us. please be our friend um, please. And, uh, yeah we like you see we made a movie about you yeah um Propaganda. Oh boy, I I did a whole my whole first bonus episode is is about the World War II propaganda mm. and boy, oh that is, whew. yeah we as I, I, this is so much happier. <laughs> but we do one of the shows on our network is doing um, Looney Tunes and watching all of them from the 1940s to now, um, building mm -hmm. a cinematic universe, a case of universe, and they did the War Years and they're like. I mean, they skipped the, a lot of the really bad Looney Tunes, but even the ones like the band ones, if outside of that, they're like some of this stuff's incredibly rough. Um, oh yeah, absolutely. Just oof. Yeah. Oof. That's hence the name of the podcast. Yes. Oof, oof. Right in the childhood. Yeah. I was just oh, I know I watched this and ooh, yeah. I didn't watch this one, but every single one so far has had me going oof, like. Yeah, it's one of those things like there's, there's some movies from my childhood that I'm slightly scared to rewatch because I'm just like, I remember this being a great film and I'm not sure I want that ruined for me because I know it will be a rewatch it. Yeah, I, I kind of feel that way too, but 
I also think that watching something that I absolutely know that I loved when I was a kid mm -hmm. helps um, kind of teach me who I am and why I am that. Mm -hmm. Well, Rob, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I had a ton of fun talking to you. Thank you for having me. As I said, it's delightful to come and uh, talk with me. And thank you for having me on. Can you tell everyone where they can, uh, the name of your podcast again, sure. just so that they can look you up so too? My podcast is called The Prestige Podcast. Um, we talk about movies every two weeks on there, but just go to kaiju.fm and you can find all of our shows on there. Um, you'll find one, hopefully, that aligns with your interest. And you can find me on Twitter at kaiju.fm. Guest episodes, when available, will drop into your feed on Thursdays after the main episode about that movie is scheduled. Make sure you don't miss a single guest episode by hitting the subscribe button on wherever you're getting your podcasts right now. You can also get updates by following me on social media. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter under the username Oof My Childhood. A transcript of this episode will be available on my website, and if you check my YouTube channel, you'll find captioned videos. I do my best to provide a transcript and video as soon as this episode is published, but if this one isn't available yet, check my website for updates and a link to the appropriate video. My theme music was composed and played by Sean Rudolph of Let Music Be. For more information on that studio, you can visit their website at letmusic.be or visit my website for an easy link. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you come back each week to discuss Disney Through Modern Eyes. And while you're at it, if you're enjoying yourself, please let your friends know about me. I'd also appreciate a rating and review wherever you're listening to the show. This podcast was recorded with the help of the Craig Chatbot and edited by me. I release a new regular episode every Monday through Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and many, many other podcatchers. So until next time, keep the magic alive.